<laughs> okay, good afternoon and thank you all for, uh, for coming to this. This is a, a presentation a little bit different from what I usually give, which uh, usually I talk about science and technology and this is a little bit more like science fiction as per uh, Ramesh's uh, request. And so I'm going to talk about things that seem kind of implausible and crazy uh, for the future, but in fact, the things that we're kind of living with today, smartphones in particular, seem sort of implausible and crazy 20 years ago. So um, I'm going to extrapolate a little bit from our recent uh, experience of the development of wireless technology and see kind of where uh, it's going to go in the next 20 years. And so let me first talk a little bit about where we are today. The, um, uh, this is a graph of the kind of the worldwide cellular telephone market. We, we're currently at about 5 billion uh, subscribers, over half the human race has a cellular telephone right now, and we typically sell about a billion cell phones a year. Um, so that means that every couple of years people get a new cell phone, and really we've uh, solved the kind of uh, historic problem that the human race has, which is we, we can't communicate with each other. And so really in the last just couple of years we've pretty much solved that problem for the first time in our, in our, in our history. And the question then is what has allowed us to get to this point? Well, really fundamentally, I think at the very, very deepest level, what's allowed us to get to this point is Moore's Law. And basically Moore's Law is very well known, you know, uh, integrated circuit technology, microelectronics technology doubles in performance or in density or any metric that you want to use about every 18 to 24 months. And what that means is that over a decade, things get, you know, about 10 times better. And over 20 years, things get about 100 times better. And over 30 years, about 1,000 times better. It's, it's actually even better than that. And so what that's meant is that the things that we used to do uh, in a phone uh, that were really large and expensive and heavy have now been shrunk down into something that's very, very small. And that shrinkage is going to continue. It's going to continue. And uh, it's not going to stop for at least the next 20 years. So. All of the electronics that go into uh, cell phones is going to continue to shrink and shrink and shrink. And it's not implausible to think that pretty much everything that we think about in a cell phone is going to be on something the size of a, the head of a, of a pen within the next, say, five to ten years, at least of a, of a contemporary cell phone. Uh, and so what is this going to allow us to do? What can we do with this technology? Well, let me, let me change subjects a bit, and then I'll get back to the, to the original topic. Um, this is an example of a, uh, a, a problem that happened about five years ago in Los Angeles. It was a typical Santa Ana kind of afternoon, and uh, people were turning on their air conditioners as they came home at the end of the day. And at about uh, late in the afternoon, there was a massive power outage in Los Angeles. And about a million people lost power, and they lost power for a day or two. And this was just you know, absolutely catastrophic for a variety of reasons, economic reasons and personal personal reasons. And the reason that it happened was, you know, in any any time there's a power outage, there's a, you know, one transformer blows somewhere. And then that that transformer blows and it cascades back towards the generation uh, facility and transformers blow along the way. So, but transformers aren't designed to blow under these circumstances. The transformers blow because they're old and they're worn out or they have some problems. And it's actually interesting, within the Los Angeles area, there are about 10,000 transformers up on poles. And some of them are over 50 years old. Some of them were put up in the late 1950s, and they continue to work great. And then over the years, they've been replaced, and so there's a, there's a distribution of transformers throughout the Los Angeles area. Some of them are in great shape. Some of them are kind of dilapidated and about to go. But the DWP has no way of knowing if a transformer is about to blow. Uh, but, there, but there is a way of kind of telling, and that is if you could measure the temperature of the transformer throughout the day, if the transformer is under load, it tends to heat up a little bit. And it heats up because the oil inside of it is old and the contacts are old and corroded. It, it gets hotter. And so if we could measure on a minute-by-minute -minute basis the temperature of all of these transformers, we could predict which transformers would blow under the next event, and we could replace them ahead of the event, and we could prevent blackouts. So. Um, this is one example of a, what I would consider like an under-censored uh, piece of our infrastructure. If we had very low-cost sensors that allowed us to monitor the minute-by-minute -minute condition of these transformers in a very low-cost manner, we could solve the blackout problem in Los Angeles during a Santa Ana condition. And this is just one example of the kind of thing that um, I think is going to evolve in wireless in the next 10 or 20 years. 
And there are all kinds of kind of hyped up names for this. I think the most common is called the Internet of Things. And the idea here is that every single manufactured object will be able to uh, connect, will be able to connect to the Internet and will be able to monitor it, will be able to sense its condition and its environment. And uh, so this is the, called the Internet of Things. Basically, anytime, anywhere, anyone, and anything will be connected to the grid. And so what are some of the implications for that? Well, one of the implications is what I just showed you. We can now monitor, we should be able to monitor transformers in a totally low cost, just transparent fashion. That should just be a complete no-brainer, easy to do in the future. Another very, very, um, uh, I think, promising application for this, and this is kind of an obvious application, is in healthcare. And uh, Professor Andy Cummel here at UCSD is working on a variety of projects to do wireless monitoring of patients, mostly kind of at the discharge uh, point. You discharge a patient, patient from a hospital. Uh, if you can monitor the blood pressure and the blood oxygen level and the temperature of that patient, you could mo see if they go into distress uh, under certain conditions, and you could get them help uh, before it's too late or before they, their condition deteriorates very rapidly. So not only is there a wireless component of this, but there's a sensor component as well. How do you sense you know, blood oxygen levels? How do you sense blood pressure in a very pac uh, passive and low-cost fashion? So certainly wireless health monitoring is going to be a big uh, uh, application of the future. And then there are crazy ideas, too, and this is one that I just came up with. You know, what if Starbucks could put a little wireless sensor in every one of their coffee cups? And actually, like, why, you know, like coffee is a very... Um, uh, people are very sensitive to the taste of coffee. There are issues of acidity and robustness and temperature. And it, it seems totally ridiculous to put a sensor in every coffee cup to measure these things. But if every sensor costs a tenth of a cent and is powered by the temperature of the coffee, Starbucks could, uh, on, on a day-to-day -day basis, collect you know, millions and millions and millions of data points on the quality of their coffee. And then they could even use social network data, like from Facebook, to figure out what parts of the country like what kind of coffee. You know, Seattle likes its coffee hot, and San Diego likes its coffee cold. And the opportunities for business, uh, you know, information systems taking advantage of this data and this data being generated in a in a torrent in a very low cost manner, are really revolutionary. I mean, there's so many applications here that simply haven't been thought of yet, that are going to be enabled by these technologies. And so, if you sort of look at the roadmap of this Internet of Things, we're sort of in the uh, RFID stage right now where we're sort of doing, you know, uh, inventory tracking and we're sort of, you know, looking at kind of gross kinds of things. But uh, as time goes on over the next five or ten years, we're going to be able to really uh, monitor and control distant objects on a, at a very, very low cost and day-to-day uh, -day basis. As, as I said before, I think the vision is for almost any manufactured object in the world to be accessible in some way by the manufacturer or by the consumer. And what are we going to do with that information? It's, uh, it's, a, it's a fascinating uh, uh, problem. So uh, really to conclude, um, I, I think what's going to happen in the next, f say, five to ten years is that advances in microelectronics technology are going to allow us to put really sophisticated wireless devices in a very, very inexpensive way into almost any manufactured object. And this technology will allow us to uh, locate these devices in space through GPS, and uh, we'll be able to get physical data about the environment, um, you know, a temperature, local chemistry, uh, electromagnetic kinds of things. And uh, then what we do with that data, there, there are economic issues, there are social network kinds of issues. It's not really clear yet what we'll do with that data, how we kind of monetize it. But uh, I, I really think it's, gonna, it's kind of like the next step in the evolution of the technology. And in fact, there are many, many really fascinating research aspects of this, which, which I haven't talked about. I wanted to just kind of present the problem. Uh, very low-cost sensors. Uh, this is something Professor Cummel's worked on a lot. Battery technology is still a huge issue in these types of devices. We need breakthroughs in battery. Uh, energy harvesting from a variety of physical uh, environmental issues, whether it's temperature or RF or maybe some kind of ultrasonics. Uh, the explosion of data that is going to... Uh, be a tidal wave onto wireless networks. How do we handle uh, this, this new type of wireless data that's hitting the networks? Security is a huge problem. Imagine the DWP example from Los Angeles. If hackers could hack into the transformer data, they could wreak havoc. So security is a big, uh, big issue. And then actually physically implementing these little tiny radios on a chip is uh, uh, 
a challenge as well. So many, many technological and research challenges are, are, are being worked on here at CalIT that address this, this vision. And uh, we really expect that the impact of these technologies is gonna, is gonna be immense, but like cellular telephony, you know, 20 years ago, or 30 years ago, Motorola had no idea how many people would wanna have a cell phone. But of course, today, everyone on the planet wants a cell phone. And we can't really predict, we can predict that the impact of this will be Im immense, but we can't really predict how it will be immense. And that's another thing that, that we'll be working on creating. So, thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Barry. Okay.